Okay, back to the 5th of May, the aftermath of the rescue of the 19 hostages. Remember what the mission was? To rescue the hostages. So, not job quite done, albeit everybody's out the back of the building. I'll come on to that in a second. Before I do, I'd like to just remind you that it's free to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Rusty Fermin SAS TV. On there, you'll be able to keep up with what I'm doing and any SAS related stories. So, that's that. The books just posted a shed full today. Both on the website, if you take a look. Here is the print that has done ever so well. Called the resolution. My website, www rusty org forward slash shop everything's on there it tells you exactly what to do so anybody who fancies any of those get on there new delivery coming so let's go back to the aftermath okay on the last one we've taken them as far as getting all the hostages out the place is on fire. We can't stay behind in there to do a post-operational procedure, which would be done exactly where everything happened. But it couldn't be that day. You've seen the flames, you've seen the fire. However, all the hostages, the one terrorist, Fauzi Nejad, police, all our guys that went through the building in the first place, the red and blue team, we're all at the back now all of us on the grass, helping to sort out hostages from terrorists, etc., etc. That was going on. We had a reception team to do that. We just needed somewhere to go and make sure that we could account for everybody because you couldn't account for them as they come through the door. So at the back of, on the, um, the big grassy area, at the back of the embassy, Everybody made sure that everybody was accounted for, which we did. We didn't want to hang around too long because um, by now there was an awful lot of guys in black out there. And we did have the hostage reception team. We had the reserve team who unfortunately missed it inside the building on that day. They were outside as well all help him with the hostage reception. Took quite a bit of time. Our job, we all kept our respirators on um, all the time. So there couldn't be any pictures taken of individuals. Then the red and blue team skulked off back through the back door of the docks house, the Royal College of General Practitioners where it all started from, where all our kit was left behind, where the snookers on TV. So that was where we ended up. And once we got inside, uh, first thing we did was ask how the snooker was getting on, uh, the Irish policeman, sergeant, and couldn't believe it. Anyway, our job now was we've just come in from an operation. Some of us had a brew. And then it was a matter of making sure all the weapons were clear. And of course, very, very soon after we got in there, all the weapons that we had were handed into forensics in plastic bags and tagged up. And they would be dealt with over the forthcoming days because we needed them as we were an operational team. So it's fair play. Take them away and they did with whatever they did. And that was the police, obviously. We, on the other hand, slow time, packed all our kit up, we had sleeping bags, all our operational kit, 
got into civilian clothes and <clears throat> bumbled around until it was time for the Metropolitan Police once again to come and pick us up outside the front right entrance to the Docks House. Very much the way we'd come in in the first place and in small vehicles three or four guys in each one they ferried us back to Regents Park Barracks the main base station but remember there that is where all our kit and equipment were left the big ladders the Range Rovers the transits any kit we didn't need or require was left there so quite safe went back um, put all our personal kit um, the personal operational kit that is back into the vehicles that we'd come up in and once that was done they were secured put a guard on them and then went into Regis Park the big big room in there and it had a television it took a little while obviously so we sat there put the snooker back on and see see what was going on a general chat amongst ourselves and then lo and behold Pete wandered in and he brought some beers in um, for the guys who weren't driving it was great not a lot just a couple I think I had two cans while I was there <coughs> and it was just a, a bit of a relax prior to the Prime Minister and then all of a sudden it was time the time was getting on now nine o'clock past eight nine o'clock in came Mrs Thatcher um, William Whitelaw and she addressed everybody in the room to say oh, job well done proud nothing like success you know all the stuff you would normally get and of course when she stood in front of the TV Jan Lehman burst into life reading the news and of course the first thing that came on was the Iranian embassy siege what did we do we saw and heard all the gunfire. Mrs. Thatcher, unfortunately, was in the way of the TV. Johnny Mac asked her politely to effing out the way, and she did. Remember, this was a surprise to us. The front, the front balcony, you know, the one that has 4,000 people on there. It didn't add four. In fact, only two of them are now with us. So they saw themselves and we saw it with them as they entered across balcony to balcony of the Iranian embassy, blow the charge in, flashbangs in, and then, and we were shocked because we had eight guys out the front where the press were, four at each side on uh, Kensington Road there. Their sole job was to blow the, the smoke generators and smoke everything off if we'd ever gone inside. However, somewhere down the line, the plan had changed. Mrs. Thatcher said, we want to show the world how we deal with terrorism. And actually, we're not going to smoke it off. We didn't know that. So we are seeing it firsthand on the news, something we didn't expect to see. And it looked pretty impressive, but the world saw it. And to this day, the world sees it, what happened. So it was just funny. The other side of the building, they were still, I suppose, wriggling around, finalizing where the hostages were, sorting out the terrorists and everything else. We, on the other hand, after the talk by Mr. Satcher, um everybody went to their vehicles slow time 
and in small packets of vehicles, not everybody piling out the gate at the same time. Controlled, back down, long drive to Hereford, um, with the thought of what had just happened. And of course, with that, people piled into the camp in different hours of the morning. But on the way back, there's a greasy spoon on the 417, the A417, the Siren Sister. In those days, it was a caravan. We used to use it quite a lot. And there we were, after one o'clock in the morning, I'm sure, eating sandwiches, bacon sandwiches. I think some had beef burgers and with onions and stuff like that, and a, and a brew before. They didn't know what had gone on. They didn't know we were because the vehicles are parked around the corner. So that aside, um, we finished that. Then it was another drive back to Hereford. Roads deserted. And of course, it was just thinking of what had happened. And it was quite a long drive back, actually. It wasn't something that was over in minutes. But we got back to the camp. On the way in, the MOD police, the old mod plod were there. Well done, guys, you know, all this type of stuff. Yep, thanks. Uh, then we go down to our secure hangars and put our vehicles inside. And our weapons we didn't have, they were still with forensics. And to be honest, it was then a trog home for everybody, by whichever means they did. I remember when I got in there, um, when I got home, I grabbed, I grabbed a bottle of whiskey. I sat down early hours of the morning, thinking about what had happened and had, I think two or three glasses Pint glasses, by the way. No, only joking. I had two or three glasses of uh, whiskey. That was me winding down, really. And then it was off to bed. And, of course, the next day we went in for parade. Then it was another drive back to Hereford. Roads deserted. And, of course, it was just thinking of what had happened and it was quite a long drive back, actually. It wasn't something that was over in minutes. But we got back to the camp. On the way in, the MOD police, the old mod plod were there. Well done, guys, you know, all this type of stuff. Yep, thanks. Uh, then we go down to our secure hangars and put our vehicles inside. And our weapons we didn't have. They were still with forensics, and to be honest, it was then a trog home for everybody, by whichever means they did. I remember when I got in there, um, when I got home, I grabbed, I grabbed a bottle of whiskey. I sat down early hours of the morning, thinking about what had happened, and had, I think, two or three glasses, pint glasses, by the way. No, only joking. I had two or three glasses of uh, whiskey. That was me winding down, really. And then it was off to bed. And, of course, the next day we went in for parade as normal. Being this, this would have been the Tuesday, Tuesday the 6th of May. And the parade really, I'm going to say parade, it just means show up. We're all in civilian clothes, um, long hair, a lot of us. Um, and it was a matter of sitting down then with the sergeant major and everybody else, the OC of the squadron, talking through the events, how it went. And then, to be honest, after that, well, we weren't actually operational really because we didn't have any operational weapons 
So, and we couldn't give statements in straight away because there was nobody to give the statements to. So that took a couple of days, but that for us was a relaxation days. We didn't do a lot. We cleaned all our stuff, everything we had, got it ready to go. Only our weapons <laughs> weren't there. But we left it sparkling, clean, put the radios on charge, put the streamlight torches on charge, everything before finally knocking off. And then some would say going on the piss. Some would say it turned out worse than that. I know I was part of it. But it was fun because you wouldn't believe that when we went downtown, uh, or Tony used to run the Bo Booth Hall. He was our first point of call, more or less. Splendid guy. Uh, if you run out of money, he'd be the first to put his hand in his pocket. After all, he'd taken it off you, hadn't he, in the bar. He ran the place. He'd give you it back. Uh, give us it back when you're next in, Rusty. Or whoever, John. So me and John Mack and uh, quite a few of the lads, Jerry, Mink. We went into town. And just as expected, we got some of the head waltz and we know who the waltz are in Hereford don't worry about that but you wouldn't believe walking through High Town you got one bank across the road you got another bank just over the road all these guys with dark sunglasses on some of them wearing combat jackets which we never ever did in town yeah, Mickey Mouse in it I, I was there <laughs> but we knew we knew half of them anyway but it was nice to see them um, that was their highlight, I think. But we took the piss out of them for years after that. Um, have I had a punch up with any of them? Yes, I have. Um, but nevertheless, that was the aftermath up until a couple of days later when we got our stuff back and then we all did our police statements individually with the policeman. What did he do all the way through? Then the police disappeared. Um, we carried on, got our weapons back very quickly. I can't remember exactly, but I should imagine within, I think three or four days, something like that, we had our weapons back, which means we're now operational again, no drinking. Um, six months, screw in the nut, because you can be called out at any time. So really, that was that. However, I might as well mention it while I'm here. That was in May 1980. Coroner's report, inquest, came out or was done on the 3rd and 4th of February 1981. Yes, on my birthday. Another coincidence? I don't know. It's all in the book. That's in Go, 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 by the way. So it's in there. If you want to read it, fine. So with that, I'll knock off until the next video, which will be either tonight or tomorrow.